welcome back. I am Elizabeth Long, the Associate University Librarian for Digital Services here at the um, library, and it's my pleasure to get to introduce the speakers for our next segment, which is to focus on metrics, measures, and rewards. The first speaker that I have the pleasure of introducing has um, a rich history of activity, which is only captured a little bit in his bio. Cameron Nalen is a biophysicist who has always worked in the interdisciplinary areas, is in an advocate of open research practice and improved data management. He currently works as advocacy director at PLOS, the Public Library of Science. Along with his work in structural biology and biophysics, his research and writing focuses on the interface of web technology with science and the successful and unsuccessful application of generic and specially designed tools in the academic research environment. He is co-author of the Panton Principle for Open Data in Science and writes regularly on the social, technical, and policy issues of open research at his blog, Science in the Open. Welcome. So thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Is that? Sounds like it's on. Yep. Um, so it's slightly embarrassing to be referred to both by Dan this morning as a pioneer in open notebook science and yesterday, for those of you here, by Tony Williams. Um, as a pioneer in altmetrics, what they really mean is that I get excited by shiny things <laughs> and easily distracted. Um, so, you know, I would normally talk about futures and possibilities and, and, and the excitement that those engender, but actually, similar, I think, to, to Garrett, I become increasingly interested in looking back um, at our values. So what are the choices we need to make about what we should be doing? Um, and how has that changed over time, um, and how does it need to change in the future? Um, Andy Sterling, a sociologist at the University of Sussex, said this wonderful thing in her talk. I recommend the talk. It's about a number of things, largely public policy and how it should be informed by research. But he makes this wonderful comment that if you want to understand the political tensions in a community, you should probe its origin myth. And so that's what I want to do. I want to probe the origin myth and maybe go some way to answering Patricia's question about how do we actually change things by reasserting what our basic values are. So let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, far off kingdom, there lived a man. His name was Henry Oldenburg and he started a journal. Right, so, so far, if you have ever been to any meeting on scholarly communications, you have seen these slides and you have heard this story. The next slide will be the one where I have Phil Trans, page one on one side of the slide, and some modern web-based journal on the other side. I would then proceed to tell you that either everything has changed or that nothing has changed, or to use that as the, 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 the start of a story that I would tell about the history of scholarly communications. I want to tell a different story. Um, and I think it's important to tell the story this way because I think we have lost our way by focusing on the object, the journal, rather than the purpose it was built to serve. So I want to talk about this man. Uh, this is Robert Boyle, 13th son of the Earl of Cork, um, lived and worked in the, in the 17th century, one of the primary players behind the beginnings of the Royal Society, um, of a lot of modern chemistry, um, and a number of other things that really sit at the root of modern sciences. If you have ever done any chemistry, you will have come across Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law says that the pressure times the volume in a closed system stays constant as you change one of those one of those parameters as long as the temperature and various other things are held constant. Um, I don't know, this is apparently not going to work. Um, but it's an anime, but this, this law makes sense because if you think of a gas held in a container and then you squeeze down on the container and make it smaller, then the particles in the gas will hit the sides of the walls more often. And it's sim sim similarly, if you increase the pressure then you're putting more particles in, so the volume or the volume needs to needs to decrease or increase. This makes perfect sense to anyone who's done any chemistry or any physics in a school, 
from the mid 20th century onwards because we have a picture of the world as made up of these particles, atoms, molecules, that bounce around and hit each other and do things. This was completely alien to people in the 17th century. The, the concept of particles suspended in a, a vacuum is very strange. I want to sort of illustrate that more strongly with this piece of instrumentation, which is one that Boyle used quite extensively. This is a Torricelli barometer. And what it is is, this is, this is in the days before health and safety in the chemistry lab. <laughs> you would fill a tube closed at one end with mercury. You would stick your thumb over the end of that tube and then upend the tube in a bowl of mercury. And that's what this piece of equipment is. And what happens is that the mercury drops down and you can see in this picture there's a gap at the top. And many of you will know exactly how high this column of mercury is because it is the height that we refer to as, as air pressure. But I'm also prepared to guess that most of you will be able to tell me what is it in the top of that tube? What is contained in the top of that tube? It's a vacuum, right? To the 17th century mind, it is absolutely clear that, that cannot possibly be a vacuum. Because if it was a vacuum, there would be nothing for light to travel through, and you wouldn't be able to see through it. It doesn't make sense. The whole concept of a vacuum, in many ways, is totally alien. So I want to emphasize this idea that it's very difficult for us to wrap our heads around the scientific view of the world at the time. It's really, really hard work. But actually, I don't want to talk to you about chemistry for obvious reasons. Um, not least, I left chemistry quite some time ago. What I really want to talk to you is about the work that Boyle did in articulating the laws of what were then, was then called natural philosophy, what we would now call science. Um, and I'm leaning extremely heavily on uh, Stephen Chapman and Simon Schaefer's book, um, The Leviathan and the Air Pump, which I do recommend as a, as, a, as a really good read. If you want to understand some of the, the philosophical issues that underpin the real, the real origins of science. So I mentioned that Boyle was a member of the, the early Royal Society, one of the people founding the Royal Society. It's interesting to think about the historical context of that. I only realised in reading this book that this is just after the English Civil War, in fact just after the Restoration. Obviously the monarchy had to be back before you could call something the Royal Society. But this is a political time where questions of whether it's possible to have disagreement or whether disagreement and discussion and different perspectives inevitably lead to civil war and the breakdown of society were real hot topics. So the idea of science, the concept that there was a space in which people could disagree was actually politically dangerous. And Hobbes in particular was very commonly articulating how dangerous this was and how d desperately these people needed to be got rid of and, and, and pushed out. This is a picture of Gresham College. This is where the Royal Society met um, in the middle of the 17th century. And again, I just want to emphasize this point that we should be looking at the society, the community itself. And this is something that comes naturally out of Boyle's writing. The point I really want to make is that while we don't, it's really hard to understand Boyle's science, it's actually really easy for us to identify with the values and the process of doing science that he articulated. And I want to do that by discussing three of the common challenges we talk about in scholarly communications today. So one of them, and we've kind of touched on this already, is the completeness of the record. The idea that we're struggling to actually express all of the detail needed um, to make research reproducible, to understand what's going on. This is the reflexive thing that anyone would put up in discussing this, is Buckeye and Donahoe's paper, saying that we've got to a point where the article can often be simply the advertisement of the scholarship. It is not the scholarship itself. Um, another paper on this, Steve Pettifer's Ceci Neipart in Hamburger, makes the same point, um, building obviously on surrealist painting. The painting is not of a pipe. The painting is not a pipe, it is of a pipe, is a representation of a pipe. And all we can ever do is represent the scholarship itself. But have we got to the point where that representation is now merely an advertisement rather than something that's actually useful? 
So this is Boyle writing in his, his main work on, on pneumatics and, and air pressure. And this is just one little extract. He spends pages justifying how much detail he puts into this book. He includes many experiments that didn't work and that he doesn't even understand why they didn't work. But he describes them in immense detail. But he goes, in, go, goes into detail so that the person I address them to might, without mistake and with as little trouble as possible, be able to repeat such unusual experiments. Reproducibility. We think this is a new thing. It sits right at the roots of science as a concept. Better than that, he even goes on to say, well, OK, not everyone's going to be able to reproduce my experiments because they won't be able to have the equipment. Um, Schaffer and Schaefer make the point that actually this equipment that, that Boyle was building was the big science of the time. There were three of these pieces of equipment in Europe 10 years after he'd started, in the same way that we actually have about the same number of synchrotrons in Europe these days. But he makes the point, for those people who can't repeat the experiments, we must have sufficient detail that they can form a clear idea of what was done and use that as the basis for their thinking about experiments. This reads to me like something you would see in a modern graduate training handbook. We touched briefly on, on access and distribution and the ability of people to actually access research. So here, um, Boyle's actually answering someone's criticism of his work. But he makes the point that he's really sorry that because he was in Ireland, he hasn't actually read all of the stuff on all of the research that relates to everything that's been described in this space. So there's a presumption already that it is appropriate and required for a, a researcher engaging with this conversation, this community of scholars, that really you ought to be reading everything. And that it's his fault for being in Ireland. I think the situation in Ireland has possibly improved a little bit over the last 350 years. Um, <coughs> but a presumption of, of access, that the distribution mechanisms worked fine, at least for those communities. And that there was a very effective distribution network. In fact, Oldenburg was at the centre of ensuring that people were getting access and that, that content was being distributed in a reasonably rapid fashion. But most of that was still happening through books to remember, not through journals. And then finally, this other third point, which is again one that we've maybe touched on a little bit, um, and I'll come back to some modern, very modern issues around this a little later. But the question of what is appropriate in review and criticism, and again, this is Boyle answering now the specific criticisms of um, Franciscus Linus, and again, Having forborne provoking language in his objections allows me in answering them to comply with my inclinations and customs of exercising civility. But there are standards of conversation, standards of discussion and discourse that involve discussing the issues and the experiments and the interpretations and not attacking the people. Again, parallel kind of modern text from 2008 um, discussing this time in the journal of scholarly publishing, how to write a good review. Say what is good about it, say what can be improved about it, and yet so often reviews are what is wrong. We seem to take joy in criticising and pulling, pulling people apart. Um, Martin goes on to talk about the, the potential problems of anonymity, that he feels it necessary to sign his name to reviews so that people don't feel that he's stabbing them in the back. And that's a, an interesting debate about the value of transparency um, versus anonymity in this space. Again, I would go back to the point, the Royal Society had a cap on the number of members of 50 so that they could all sit around a table and talk to each other. The conversation in the community was at the centre of this process. So anonymity in the review process is actually something that got invented pretty late in the process. This is the same quote I showed here, but I'd actually ellipsed, ellipsed out this little bit, because I think it's really interesting. Again, this notion of human contact, of the importance of recognising that you are in contact with a human. This is Boyle making explicit the point that he hasn't met this person. He feels that significant enough that he has to say 
this is the first time I've come into contact with this person, and therefore I need to acknowledge that they are part of the process, that they are engaging with me in the process that I am, that I recognise as the right way to do this. Again, he's engaging with a civil discourse amongst scholars on the issues. He then goes on to absolutely shred Linus's argument. He is brutal. But he spent three and a half pages being really polite and welcoming him into this community of scholars before he does that. The human interaction was something that clearly he thought important. So there's this sense of, I don't know you, but there are a set of rules of behaviour that we have, a set of values we have, which you observed. Um, and so, yeah, welcome, welcome to the club. And I use this picture advisedly. Because I think we do have to ask some questions about whether those values really are our values. At the end of the day, this was a group of wealthy white men in one country, in one place, in fact, largely of one political persuasion. They were all members of the Royal Society 20 years after the end of the Civil War. That was a political statement at the time. So we should ask, I mean, I've sort of explored and, and, and suggested that the, these values are the values that sit at the core of modern science and modern in the historical sense as well as modern in our you know, contemporary science. But there are clearly some values that don't sit well with us, not least that when Boyle, 13th son of the Earl of Cork, said something, it was considered more reliable and more important than if Robert Hooke said it. Because Robert Hooke was a commoner. You may see some parallel with the question that Dan was posed about publishing in Nature. But I think it's also important to realise that the early Royal Society, the community of scholars growing at the time, was solving a collective action problem. They had to agree a mode of acting. They had to agree a way of doing this thing which we have come to call science. And because it was a collective action problem, it was important that in reaching consensus on these things which were difficult, that they already had consensus on a bunch of other things. So actually the small scale, the homogeneity of the people involved, actually sits at the core of their success, even as it may rub up us the wrong way at the distance of 350 years with a focus on diversity and inclusion and global engagement. So what went wrong, and I've obviously, I've set this up, the problem, the reason we've lost many of these things, the reason we seem to be returning to these as issues that we need to solve today, are fundamentally issues of scaling. And the systems that we put in place, using the best technologies available at the time over the past 350 years, have started to break down because they are unable to scale up to manage the conversation that we have today. Let me give you again three examples of that, the same three examples. Uh, this is a page from Linus Pauling's PhD thesis. It also happens to be um, an article that was published in the Journal of the American Chemical Society. Again, kind of interesting to note that in about 1920, it was possible to just take a copy of articles from Jacks and stick it in your thesis and no one even bothered about it. But anyway, over here is the data. This is the data for this article. Those are measurements that Pauling did by sticking a piece of film in a particular place in an instrument. And that's more or less all the data because the experiment by our standards today was really pretty simple, hard to do, heroic, but it didn't actually generate very much data. So it could all fit in the, in the article and, and, and that's just fine. Somewhere between then and this perhaps rather more famous paper from the 1950s, it became okay to just express an opinion and just throw in a picture. The data in Watson and Crick's paper on DNA structure isn't in the article at all. Now, this is a really beautiful piece of theoretical work, but it's interesting, the editor, this, this in, incidentally was not sent out for peer review as an article. Um, the editor just published it as was because it was self-evidently true. 
but sometime in the, in, the, in the process, the data has been lost out of the article. And then we move to a situation today, this is the paper reporting the finding of a particle consistent with the standard model picture of the Higgs boson, um, in which we know that in this experiment, 99.99% of the data never even makes it off the instrument. It's thrown away before it's even considered to be stored because there is just so much of it. The experiments we do today, whether they're at the Large Hadron Collider or whether they're in the departments around here, are generating far more data than could ever fit within, or could, should fit, within the pages, whether electronic or printed, of a journal. The scaling of our data was not captured by a technology variously made up of things from the 17th century, the 19th century, and the 20th century, to communicate research. All right, so let's look at the, the access and distribution problem. Okay, here's a graph. This is not the cost of serial subscriptions <laughs> over the 20th century. The curve looks similar. And the curve looks similar for an interesting reason. What this is, in fact, is a graph of the number of students per 10,000 capita in universities globally. For many, many hundreds of years, nothing much had happened here. Very small number of people were doing research, very small number of people were being educated to university level. End of the Second World War, there is a sudden consensus that governments should fund directly research and that there is a need for educated people to come through universities and be trained in this new science and technology thing. I actually went to a school um, in Western Australia called Perth Modern School. It was founded in about 1920, and it was called modern because the curriculum included German and French as languages as opposed to just Latin, but also because they had science and maths on the high school curriculum. Post Second World War, when it was science what won the war, whether it's radar, or the nuclear bomb. There's a very clear sense we needed to grow this population. Student numbers increased, the funding for research increased radically. This created a problem for publishers. Now, up to about this point, most scholarly publishing was a loss-making operation. It was done on a relatively small scale. It was done on a relatively local scale. You've heard some of those stories. Suddenly, there was a need to distribute journals and research globally on a scale that had never been done before. And this was a really serious problem. There were real concerns at the time that the scholarly publishing industry community could collapse because it just couldn't cope. Something interesting happens in 1952 when Robert Maxwell acquires Pergamon. Now this is, again, the origin myth of the serials crisis. The story we tell is this rapacious robber baron purchased Pergamon, turned it into a commercial operation, then inspired the other major commercial presses to adopt the same kind of approach, started jacking up the serials prices, started expanding the number of journals. There's another version of this story, which is that if Maxwell hadn't taken this process, hadn't brought the sensibilities of mass production and industrialization into the scholarly publishing industry, that it would have collapsed. Or that if that hadn't happened, then the capital that was required to manage the beginning of the digital transition in the mid to late 90s simply wouldn't have been there to take scholarship online. It's a different version of that story. I don't say it's one that I completely buy into. There might have been other options. But there was a scaling problem. Maxwell solved it amongst a number of other people and made a lot of money out of it in the process. But that's what innovators do, perhaps. So let's look at civility and, and effective review, peer review in particular. Um, I really didn't make this up. Um, <laughs> this is um, not an unusual view amongst many researchers. Um, but there's a reason for this. And again, I want to suggest that one of the reasons why peer review, an invention of the mid-19th century that was not common until the mid-20th century, or to emphasize 
that we've lost the human interaction because we had to invent these systems of anonymous and scaling review. We had to put them in pre-publication because of the scale of publication, the number of articles being published, the number of pages available to print them in meant there had to be selection, meant there had to be a process of, of screening and winnowing, and that the scale and requirements of the process as we move from a few hundred thousand articles to a few million meant that that process had to become in some sense anonymous or at least not one of a human discussion between scholars, between peers. Some of you may, seen, may have seen this yesterday. Um, it happens that the journal this occurred in is PLOS One. Um, though, and thank you for Dan for mentioning the Bohannon um, scam, I was going to say, maybe that's a Freudian slip. Um, I would actually say, and I'm perfectly prepared to defend this on the record, that actually PLOS One was probably the journal in the world with the best chance of stopping this happening, but also because of the kind of checks we have to put in place. But the kind of checks we have to put in place because of the scale of operation that we are running. It is also the journal where there's the highest risk of something like this slipping through. I mean, this is a failure of taste, of ethics, of systems at many levels. But the point I want to make with this is that I can't imagine this person making that comment if they were sitting across the table from the authors. At least I'd really like not to think <laughs> that that could happen. And if it did, that if the rest of the community was sitting around the table with them, then I'd like to think they get slapped down pretty damn fast. The point being that if we want to re-engage in civil, effective discussions in which we are focusing on the issues of the research, not on the people, as is very clearly the case here, that we need ways of doing it. Another interesting side effect of this in terms of scale is the way this turns out into a, a Twitter storm very rapidly, and it's actually quite difficult to respond to. We don't actually have the systems that effectively allow us to manage these conversations at large scale about how we should be managing the scholarly communications process, which is an interesting kind of turn on itself. All right, so that's fine. We have a set of problems. I will argue that 350 years ago, the values that people were trying to create, the community that people were trying to create, was at least expressing values that should solve or should have solved some of those problems. Um, of course, someone like me will stand up, well, the web scales, it's a scalable network, it does this stuff, so it must solve the scaling problems. That's a talk I would have given two years ago. Um, the ways one would say that we do it, we break the print paradigm that allows us to spread out the data, to put the data where it needs to be, the articles where they need to be, the, the claims, the, the registrations. These things can be spread and put into places where they belong. And then, as Dan was saying, you can bring them together as you need them. We don't need to worry about page limits or whether something has, whether this particular container of containers has the right kind of containers for the kind of objects we're trying to put into them. We don't need to force data-shaped pegs into article-shaped holes because we have things called databases. And that's the right place to put data. So I can move away from the, from the restrictions of print and, and move to the, the affordances we have online. The web can mediate many-to-many -many rela relations, which has the potential for having very sophisticated means of access and distribution that do not need to be restricted, that do not need to be managed, and do not necessarily need gatekeepers. And the web has all shown us that there are ways of restructuring attention. The, the examples of this that you're probably aware of are things like Uber and Airbnb, where the possibility of mediating these reactions, these interactions, of getting the attention to the right places can actually change what is possible in terms of connecting people up with each other, but can definitely change the way in which we assess and validate and think about what is worth looking at. And that's all fine. And I can talk for hours about the different kinds of things we might want to do there. And, and Dan's mentioned some of them. I'm sure we're going to hear some more of them on the, on the way through. But which ones? How? What is it that matters? Where should we be focusing our attention? What should we be building, given that we have limited resources? 
And maybe let's ask ourselves the harsh question, why hasn't it already happened? What is it about scholarly communications that means unlike the music industry and unlike newspapers and unlike banking, for heaven's sake, we talk about ourselves as relatively conservative, but for heaven's sake, banking is being restructured. Why haven't we moved faster? And I want to suggest that part of the reason is we're actually thinking about the incentives the wrong way around. The success of the early Royal Society was built in the fact that it was a homogeneous group of people solving a collective action problem. It was a club. And it was a closed club. And that was great as a way of solving that particular problem at that particular time. But it also builds a conservatism into the system. It makes solving these collective action problems harder because we need to break and reform and change those clubs, bring more people into them, make them more diverse, make them more relevant to today's circumstances. And whether it's the power structure that means that nature papers are more important than plus one papers for many people in many places, or the fact that the Royal Society is still largely populated by white, wealthy men. Those are the things we need to start thinking about breaking down. But it also leads us into another particular kind of story that we tell ourselves. So when we talk about open access or open data or all of these kinds of things, we often frame it this way. We often frame it as a question of how do we persuade the researcher, the community, the dean, the provost, the scholarly society, the journal editor, to take what belongs to them and make it public, make it available to everyone. That's the kind of discourse that we have. And it sets up some interesting dichotomies. We heard some of those today, the difference between commercial publishers and not-for-profit publishers. Might argue the American Chemical Society is one of the most rapacious scholarly publishers in the industry. It's a not-for-profit organisation. Um, there are many commercial organisations in the publishing industry that actually do have really strong values. I think Ubiquity Press is one that's built on a, on a really sh strong sense of values. But it's a for-profit organisation. And Brian Hull, the, the director, makes no bones about that. In fact, talks about how that improves his ability to deliver on the mission that he set for himself. So that private versus public, commercial versus not-for-profit, I think is a, is, a, is a false dichotomy. It also leads us into a particular kind of political rhetoric, one of nationalisation. But I think perhaps most critically, it's led us to a place where we tend to think about those kinds of actions and economics that support public goods, utilities and infrastructures. So I asked Dan the question. And to think about those mechanisms that we know work for public goods. And we make the assumption that knowledge is a public good, therefore we must support it in the same way. And those ways are things like legislation to force everyone to do the thing make sure everyone puts their seat belts on, and taxation to build roads, systems, infrastructures. And we can talk about whether APCs are taxation, whether subscriptions are taxation, but we tend to get into the fairly limited set of options. Not that they're bad options. Not that they're bad ways to think about the problem but that they're limited. Because this picture of a dichotomy between private and public, between the individual and the public, between commercial and not-for-profit, is a limited version of the story. And many of you have probably seen this diagram. It comes from Eleanor Ostrom. If you think about the way goods, and I'm talking about you know, goods, things that are objects of exchange, exist in the real world, the question of whether they're private or public is only one part of the story. There are broadly kind of two categories we need to consider. One is whether they're rivalrous or non-rivalrous. So that is, if I give you an apple, I no longer have an apple. 
if I give you the light on the end of my candle, we both have light. The light of the candle is non-rivalrous, the apple is rivalrous. Physical goods tend to be rivalrous, digital goods tend not to be for the most part. That's one area. And then the other is whether it's excludable or non-excludable. So if I have it, can I stop you using it? So money is excludable. If I have money, I can usually, or there is legislation in place that stops you from just taking it from me and doing things with it. But in a fishery, for instance, it's really hard to stop someone coming in and doing some fishing unless you have really strong systems around that. It's a really difficult and really expensive thing to do. So in economic terms, what we refer to as private goods are both excludable and rivalrous. Money is the most obvious example. And public goods are those things that are non-rivalrous and non-excludable. Generally, we rely on governments to provide these. And we rely on private industry to maximise the production of these things. And we move things around a bit. Um, you might certainly argue that the idea of copyright is to create a, a, a mechanism by which something that could be more widely shared becomes a private good, becomes more excludable, for the purpose of ultimately, when, back in the days when we had copyright terms that didn't last forever, ultimately made sure that it made, it in, made its way into the public space. But there are now two other quadrants in this diagram. The one up on the top left is, is commons. I mean, you'd be a little bit careful talking about commons in this particular sense. These are things that are rivalrous and not excludable. So these are things like fisheries and forests and things like that that, that tend to get exploited and broken down. This is what the tragedy of the commons is supposed to be about. Um, when we talk about digital commons, they tend to be closer to public goods. But this quadrant down here is quite interesting. Things that are non-rivalrous doesn't hurt my use of something to give it away, but are excludable. Subscription journal articles, for instance. A data set, which I have in my group, but I decide not to share. And what I want to argue is that what we need to think about is the process of taking club goods and turning them into public goods. We've got into this, I think, trap of saying knowledge is a public good. And that's a great political statement, or a useful political statement. Um, but it's not true. Again, I create knowledge in my research group. I can choose not to share that. I can just leave it on my hard drive. It doesn't have to be physical access. Dan's already mentioned language. It might be that semiotic frameworks and epistemological frameworks don't transition well into a public discourse space. Or I just use big words to exclude you. The process of publishing is one of making club goods more public. That's the assertion I'm, I'm making. It's one's of investing resources, often resources that it were in the process of sustaining those clubs, which might be journals or research groups or disciplines or domains or scholarly societies, and choosing to make them more public. So it's this kind of direction. But if I draw that arrow and I framed this as an economic argument, then there's an obvious question. If our assertion is these clubs, societies, journals, research groups, departments, universities, institutions, perhaps private companies, should be doing this, should word, always a great word, what are they getting back? What's actually coming back into that club to make sure that the club is sustainable in the longer term? And Garrett made a version to this argument when he talked about open access. Here are a set of club goods, articles in a subscription journal, that we would like to, we would love to make available. But what are we going to get in return and how are we going to ensure that that in somehow is fungible with the money we require to actually run the operation? Because the kind of things we're likely to get back, attention, readership, prestige, may or may not be easily convertible into the money which is actually required to make the operation sustainable. Those are the questions I think we should be asking ourselves when we think about where to put our resources 
to try and understand what it is we can change. So what is the club getting back, I think, is the question that we haven't asked. And then that solves another problem, which is the one of the incentives. We keep talking about incentives at the individual level. So we have a conversation. We tell ourselves this story. Wouldn't it be great if the researchers shared their data? And so then we say, so what are the incentives we need to give to the researcher to share their data? And we can say, well, they'll get more citations, or we'll do this, or we'll do the other. And then we end up in this place where we say, oh, that's great, but they don't believe us because the culture of their community doesn't actually do anything with that. So we need to change the culture, and changing culture is hard. But where does the culture come from? The culture comes from the incentives at the group level. So if we're looking at what the group is getting back, then we will change the culture as part of the process rather than asking for it to happen later. And that actually offers a whole set of different economic models. The membership model of PJ is one, and, um, but there are a whole series of other models in the economics of clubs. There is a whole literature on the economics of clubs that tells us about what does and does not work and how to manage that sustainability problem. So, I want to get back to an origin myth that focuses on the community and the community values, that recognises that research and scholarship is a whole set of collective action problems bound up in the interaction between communities that the values that were articulated 350 years ago can still be the guiding light for a lot of what we're doing, but that we need to recognise the strengths and weaknesses of how this actually happens in practice. And if it sounds like I'm turning into a humanist from my roots <laughs> in the biophysics, there may be some truth to that. So I just want to finish with sort of reflecting that we, we've broken Boyle's laws over the years um, because of scaling problems, because of issues with the technology that was available to us. We have a new set of technology available to us today, which allows us to relook at that and rethink it again. But actually, if we go back to this Boyle's law, we broke this one as well. Because the volume's certainly been increasing for a long time, and I would say that people have been under quite a lot of more pressure over the years. If we can solve that, then maybe we have a way forward. And I will stop there. Thank you. <laughs> This is actually kind of a half-formed question, I have to admit. Um, and in some ways, it, it ties a little together both Chris and Cameron's um, presentations. And I, it, you're talking about um, scientists at CERN really made me think about, I, I've been involved in a project with some of the HEP scientists um, working actually on data software preservation. They're very concerned about how to do that and not just the citability, but the real, how do you keep software long term? And so all the issues around the environment that it you know requires and all those dependencies and, and such. Um, but what I've learned in the process of working with them is it's a very interesting model they have that not only, as Cameron commented, do they throw away the majority of their data before they even, I mean, you know, in the milliseconds after it comes off of, you know, the detectors, um, and that they, they're dealing always with, with this process. But the way in which they are a community and a club in many ways, and the way in which I was really interested to hear them refuse to talk about who had discovered the Higgs boson, that it was, in fact, a collaborative process to decide when and at what point they could make that announcement that it was, you know, there are two different completely separate groups that work on similar things, the Alice and the, the um, CMS, and that it came jointly out of both of those groups that usually work much more independently because they detect the same type of things, but they have detectors that work in very different ways. And so I wonder what we might learn from, I mean, they, they really almost offer a new or different model of ways in which they collaborate. And I think the astrophysicists also have a very collaborative process around, the, and they have to in some ways because of the big expensive instruments they have. But it made me wonder what we could learn from them and think about how might that become metaphors or actually realities of structures that could be used in other sciences. So, any, that one? 
um, in the particle physics community is fascinating. And I can never, I can never really figure out whether we can really draw lessons from them or whether it's entirely different. And because the, the obvious difference being there's so much money at stake um, that there are certain things that have to happen. There has to be governance, there has to be trust, there has to be management of exchange rates, for heaven's sake. Um, so there's, there's, there has to be this really serious focus on infrastructure. There has to be this really f serious focus on managing the data, and it can't be done. The, the science cannot be done by less than thousands of people. Um, so I'm still really trying to figure out, as are many other people, how to disentangle the things that are specific to the to that community and the things that aren't. And I think you, you, you put your finger on at least one of the, the two major comparators that I think are useful. One is the astronomy community, very similar in terms of coming from a similar dis disciplinary background, um, also very big kit, um, but more dispersed um, and maybe not quite as not quite as expensive, though that's changing with the SKA, I guess, and, and LSST. So, um, so, may, so that's going to be an interesting thing to observe. Um, but the, there's, another, there's another large facilities community in the material sciences and in chemistry. Um, and again, you'd think, and that's actually where I came from before <coughs> I moved to PLOS. Um, so I've seen these communities close up. And so they come from a different disciplinary background in terms of being in chemistry. Um, they also have very large facilities. They have governance mechanisms um, that are not dissimilar to the way that um, CERN works, but tend to be on a slightly smaller scale. But there's much less of the sharing and coordination that happens. And I'm interested in trying to tease apart whether that's because chemistry is traditionally a much more individual and individualistic discipline, or whether it's because there's much different types of science going on in those facilities compared to a CERN or, you know, if, you, if you're going to go to ESO, you're doing astronomy. Um, if you're going to go to where I used to work, the ISIS neutron source, you could be doing anything from um, quantum physics through to biology. So I, I, I don't know the answer, but I think they're interesting things to figure out. Well, I, I just think one, one other thing, though, is that there, there are differences even within our communities, right? Like, I think the general thing to say is that, oh, astronomy data is all open, but it isn't, you know, it isn't like some groups actually control access to it. And uh, what I think is, and, and, and it's not entirely unique, but these uh, big projects. Uh, so I, I actually was just thinking about the great, the, uh, uh, the time of, uh, you know, the they were developing these uh, telescopes with, uh, with you know, the great observatories, right? And, uh, and they had to come together. So much money, so much infrastructure is being put, you know, built that they, they had to come together and agree on sort of common commonalities, common you know, norms for the community. Um, and so those kind of events actually, I think, inspire the, the rest of the community uh, to sort of do the sim similar things in the end, you know, like so, so that money coalescing around big projects has an impact in, um, you know, in other areas within the community. Um, yeah. I think, I mean, the other thing, the other thing that strikes me when you say that is we also, so the other place where this obviously happened was in the Human Genome Project. So again, you have large amounts of money, large coordinated effort, but maybe we don't, so it struck me is the way we don't also recognise the critical importance of individuals in pushing those decisions. So the, the story we tell about the Human Genome Project is that the Wellcome Trust and the NIH dictated. But they only did that really because Francis Collins and John Sulston marshalled a community to say, you should dictate to us. And I don't, I, don't, I don't know the history of astronomy or particle physics well enough to know whether there were sort of critical people. They write books. <laughs> and that's where everyone gets named in the book, you know, like, yeah. yeah. But I guess when it was, you know, are there particular people that really at the beginning of CERN, for instance, that, that took, took decisions that pushed in that direction of making things public, of being open? I mean, you, you imagine Tim Berners-Lee working anywhere else except CERN. <laughs> the world would be a very different place today. Yeah. Um, but it's so embedded in the culture that, that was the obvious thing was to throw it out in the public web into the public domain. <laughs> Yeah, that's got a really those, deeply embedded culture. Those people also break out or branch out to, that has impacts in, in sort of inter, interdisciplinary ways or, yeah. Well, it seems to me they also very much um, created structures within their groups 
that kind of address some of the concerns and problems. I mean, everyone talks about the open data that the astronomers make, but they don't release it the first year. And they have, you know, there's a lot of structure that they actually created. And again, someone was behind thinking up what would create the motivations and the checks and balances. And without that, it probably might not have happened and gone down that path. I wonder if we can learn different things if we look at a different kind of community, rather than looking at a discipline-specific one. If we look at geospatial users that cross different areas, very different world. If we look at chaos theory that automatically crosses different worlds, we're probably going to see very different structures and infrastructures. And that may be what, in the long run, has a much better long-term infrastructure than these individual disciplines. Um, yes, absolutely. And tool, tool use as a defining, you know, communities of practice are defined by the tools they use in many cases. It's interesting, you're actually mirroring a conversation we had internally um, at PLOS a little while back when we wanted to, we were asking the question, if we're going to roll out some new, some new offerings, which communities should we, should we focus on? And so, you know, the answers came back, oh, well, we should talk to the geneticists and the neuroscientists. And, and I was saying, well, we should talk to those scientists who edit Wikipedia or those scientists interested in aspects of opening up peer review, or those, you know. Um, and it, that was because you have you know, greater leverage there. I think for me, so the way, I, the way I think about the sort of, if you like the social engineering that I'm interested in trying to achieve here is that what the, the literature on collective action tells us is that essentially groups come together to solve problems, um, to solve problems that they share um, and have collectively. And some of those communities are easier to see than others, um, but they generally, the way this happens, the way cultural change and collective action happens is a group comes together to do what they think is the right thing, regardless of whether it's in their personal interest. And then that group starts to expand and get more traction. And then at some point you run into this space you can talk about this in terms of technology adoption and Christensen and the Innovators Develop Dilemma or various other sort of technology transfer kind of ways of thinking about it. But you reach a point where people are not, the, the group's now big enough that people are not just going to do it because it's the right thing. There needs to be some sort of incentives. But something else happens because there's generally another group over here often motivated by similar things but not necessarily exactly the same things, not necessarily completely aligned. And one thing that does often happen, and one might suggest that this is a characteristic of some aspects of the open access debate, is that sometimes when those groups start to meet each other, they actually become opposed and you get political stasis. And this is, a common, this is common in political change in lots, of, in lots of settings. So my theory is that there are two things we can do. We can support a group over here and a group over there and happen to give them interoperable infrastructure that sort of helps to align them that might be a role that societies or libraries might want to play. But also because these communities will overlap, because they don't have to be defined by, by um, their discipline, by their technology, or as we were, you know, we, not so long ago, we were pretty much restricted by geography, um, much less so today. So we have lots of options to think about how these groups are overlapping and how we can turn... Um, Nick Sousa at the Queensland University of Technology has this nice phrase, I'm not quite sure how to make it work yet, but the object is to turn clubs into networks, or wire clubs into networks. And so these, these clubs or communities that cross over each other, you know, the Python community in the, the, the biological Python community and the, and the astronomical Python community have something in common. And can we use that to, to drive cohesion? Is, I don't know how. <laughs> But it seems like it should work. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add one more thing to that, that uh, I think there's some really I mean, some interesting work being done by Chris Lintod and the, and the Zooniverse people, the citizen science people, to actually even open up this network further and to really reduce the barriers and allow people. I think it was impressive that they, they actually had a project called Quench, which uh, used actually Authoria to write a paper with all the the citizen scientist, right? And so I think that that's sort of an, an interesting, you know, uh, another angle on this of opening it besides just the clubs, the scientific clubs, to, but to the, to the actual, you know, community outside. 
Yeah, the, the, the police communities don't have to stop at 30, 53rd and Ellis. Yeah. <laughs> uh, related to, I think, this last question, uh, what would be the role of legislation in bringing a club, to pri uh, club goods to public goods? I mean, it creates all sorts of resistance from those members of the club, but is that really the only way to get, or, or should it be the more organic collective action that you're describing, Cameron? Um, so you want, in an ideal world, you manage to apply both. You know, in, a, in an ideal world, what happens? And again, refer you to the work of Ostrom and, and her, her research group and um, who really worked on this um, for many years. There are a couple of different things that happen. Either you know, groups start to come together and somehow, through luck, in many cases, they are cohe there's enough cohesion that they retain alignment and things actually change. Um, what generally happens in those circumstances is actually that you end up with these flips and you end up with... Um, sorry, I'm going, to, I'm going to drift into a physical sciences analogy. I apologise to the people in the room. But there's a, thing, there's a thing called a spin glass, which happens when you have um, lots of little magnetic fields in a material... And what tends to happen is that as you quench the fields, they end up flipping over and the whole thing becomes non-magnetic. But the way to fix that is at the right point in time and at the right temperature to impose an external field on the system. So legislation is an external field on the system. Um, the question is, when is the right time to apply it? Because the ideal time is when the community very strongly believes that this is the right thing to do and they're just, you're just about going to do it, but no. And seat belts are probably a particularly good example of that. Um, I'd choose an example not from scholarly communications just to be on the safe side. Um, but I think you can certainly make a case that the, um, the mandates in the UK have come too early. I, I think that would, be a, that would certainly be an argument you could advance and would be worth exploring. So I think what's new is that we can think about if we step back, we can think about helping these groups interact and coordinate, or if you want to you know, stretch my physical analogy to, a, to its breaking point, we can think about different kinds of fields that can be applied by offering you know, interoperable technology, platforms, infrastructures that make things easy. Um, and so what I'm really interested in, and why I keep coming back to this club goods, club goods, public goods, public goods, how does that return goods back into the club space? So in a pure economic analysis, the question becomes one of what do we build to make the process of the club deciding to invest in turning, making things more public cheaper for the club, infrastructures, technologies, and what do we build that maximises the benefits so that something comes back to that, to that club. So I think there's, what, what's new about the web is that we can consider building technological systems and platforms that help us get from scattering of groups of people thinking that the world should change, but not necessarily knowing of each other or working together. And again, the open science community is a million different bubbles not talking to each other. Um, how do we get from there through this difficult political place where people start bumping against each other and, you know, our oh, Centre of Open Science got that grant and I can't do that work and well, they're just sucking up all the money or, you know, those kinds of issues. Um, and I'm picking on them because they're nice people. Um, through to the point where it becomes obvious that the best way to finally get everything into alignment is to just bring the hammer down and say, yes, this is the way that things are done now. Um, but it doesn't have to be, also doesn't have to be mandates again. Classic example, the open access mandate at the University of Liège is not a mandate. There is no requirement on any member of staff to put anything in the institutional repository at the University of Liège. It just so happens that the way your CV is generated for your annual appraisal <laughs> is by taking things out of the repository. But your, your choice, put it in, don't put it in, up to you. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Um, I think we're at time now, so let's uh, give a round of applause to all of our morning speakers. <laughs> <laughs>